been a minute since we've taken a look at our living wall system. Certainly been a little while since we looked at our friendly chickens too. That'll be an update video soon enough. But I figured after a nice uh, rain last night, we had two days in a row with some decent rain, so we're getting caught up again on moisture. And the living wall is just growing like crazy, thick as anything. So let's take a look and see how things stand. Definitely some issues here or there, but overall it's doing really nicely. So stick around. I'll start here with the long view from across the road. Here's the east side, thick enough that you can basically see the roof of the house and that's about it. And the west side, which from this angle has now filled out enough that you can't even see that there's a high tunnel just on the other side there. A little, little more gaps here, there on the west side, but overall pretty legit and a little room in the driveway. I have to prune every week or so just enough. Basically, I walk out to the point where a normal person in a car or truck would be having to figure out who's coming or going and prune things so that it's uh, safe enough for us to come and go and for visitors to come and go. But this has filled out to the point where uh, you're hard pressed to see a drop of light, especially on this side. There's enough density and complexity in here now that we're at a stage where I need to start making some decisions around who gets chopped and dropped, which is probably for me one of the hardest things to do is set, set in motion all these different plants, these amazing beautiful plants, and we want to keep the diversity because there's resiliency in that. Um, but so we need to basically like how do I prune my way through here so I can get in to do some management in there? So is it like do I cut some of the hazelnut? Do I cut some of the sunchokes? Do I cut these Japanese walnuts that volunteered because some squirrels planted them in? Are they going to get too big? It's a little hard to say. What I tend to do instead for now, because these plants don't mind it, is basically just push my way in. It's not as though this is a zone one garden that we're coming into every day to go and pick lettuce. It's just basically managing the interior of a jungle. It's pretty special push my way through the miscanthus grass past the aronia and the English walnut into the interior. We are about 12 feet from the road right here. The road's over there. You'll be able to see the car go through, but this is what the inside of a thriving living wall looks like mid-season and this is in a cold climate you can see here's the English walnut this will be one of the overstory elements in the long run and so some of the management that has to happen for them is to keep the miscanthus pruned back it's an amazing mulch plant and I'll cut them flush to ground and lay them down as mulch to support this walnut I'll keep a little eye on the hops and the grapes which the Vines are real wild cards in systems like this, but they're great mulch too. I think once you start thinking of everyone as wonderful biomass and soil building when they're chopped and laid down, it takes a little pressure off. But you can see everyone's kind of knitting together, and this is making more resiliency from moments of extreme heavy wind. It's kind of knitting the whole system together. You could hear the car, but you couldn't see it. That's kind of fun. There are little rabbits that are starting to live in here now, which are completely fine by us. They can stay, they can raise kids in here. There's nothing tender or precious down below in here. So if they choose to make this their habitat, we're happy to have them. Voles definitely live in the duff of the miscanthus over winter. They actually make these beautiful little nests in between the stalks they weave and shred the leaves and live down in here. If they venture into the chicken yard, the chickens will eat them. It's a boost for protein, but there's enough going on out here that we don't have to worry about who might be coming in here to make a life for themselves. You can see there are grapes all through this wall in here. This is the actual fence for the chicken yard. And between the grapes and the hops, it gets dense enough that in a little while, the wild birds will more likely than not 
make another round of summer housing and nests inside of this. These huge leaves make for really nice roofing material to keep nests protected. So they'll find some nooks that are really well knit back in there and make some nests. They'll probably August or so, there seems to be a moment where when I walk by the fence, it feels like the fence is yelling at me. The leaves just kind of shake and I'm guessing it's the birds with their kids. Let me get back out to the road. <laughs> Might as well grab a snack on my way. Black currant, productive even in the shade. That's pretty fun. Mm. So if I were designing this space for ease of access or for a U-pick operation, it'd be a miserable failure. But for density, you can't beat it. Probably about 40 different species in there, 25 of which could have some catastrophic failure and we'd still have some coverage from the road. Nature's been very helpful in filling out some of the gaps in here too. Certainly to your eye, this could read as just complete um, weediness and that would be a true statement. This is an un or a barely managed scene right here, right next to the road. We have tried adding in garlic, uh, Viper's Bougloss, Sasha added, and that worked pretty well for a little while. But this is an incredibly tough situation. There's a huge amount of road salt and BS coming off of cars that washes out here. This is really trashed, rough soil. It's kind of like, it was just gray sand that they dumped in and compacted. And over the last few years, chicory and Queen Anne's Lace have shown up, both amazing deep tap-rooted decompacting plants. Burdock has shown up. You can see it's a good signature. The, this is second year burdock and it's only gotten this tall, I think because the soils are so depleted and tight. And so here are these beautiful flowers. Let this car go. Ugh, taking on the gross fumes from the cars and trucks, whatever pollutants come off of their wheels and making nectar while they go and decompacting the soil. So I think by allowing these plants to be here for a few years, going through their life cycles, dropping seed, leaving their roots to die in the soil, it'll soften and condition it to the point where we can have some other more complex diversity in here. But for now, we're so thrilled that they're willing to be here. This is the northeast corner of the whole scene on our way over to our neighbor's food forest from lawn conversion project and some very serious work that needs to be done for sure. We've got now some more tree layers that have been added in. There's some uh, walnuts, some English walnuts, some black walnut, um, a butternut here, some red buds. So we're basically expanding out this hedgerow and the early succession parts of this wall, which are the alders and the willows, have now grown so much that two things are happening that need to be put in check. Number one, the alder in particular is just growing incredibly fast. That is its nature, right? It's a very fast early succession tree. And so now that we've had some good rains, what I need to think about doing is coming through and cutting this back. It seems harsh, but cutting it right around here, right around head height, taking all of that green, luscious, nitrogen-rich material, chopping it up with pruners to feed these other layers, two things will happen. One, there'll be a huge nitrogen release that'll feed the sunchokes, the English walnuts, the red buds, the raspberries, the mints that are all in here. Um, so there'll be a, a nutrient release, there'll be a light release that will help these boost up, and then the regrowth from these will fill out where we want the visual and wind barrier. Left to their own devices, what will ultimately happen, you've seen this with privacy plantings before, is if they're never pruned, they just get taller and taller and taller to the point where there's complete visibility. You can see it's starting to happen. Most of the canopy is way above where we want it. So they'll get taller, they'll get leaner below, and there'll be so much shade that other elements won't be able to thrive. So that is a pretty big management project. I'll probably document that in a separate video, a uh, mid-season chop and drop, but there's mountains of mulch and fertility to be had from pruning these back to release light to other members that are a little bit lower. You can see if that w the willow and alder and even this poplar were cut back, 
how much more light would come down to this layer which has some uh, new varieties of willow, some perennial sunflowers which could certainly use a bit more light, and even the miscanthus I think would get a little bit stronger. There's a gap in here that I think the perennial sunflowers are starting to fill out, but more light coming in would really help to boost that element up. It's a closed system now. There's truly zero reason for me to consider at all bringing in a bale of hay, bringing in compost, you know, fertilizer, any of that kind of stuff. There's just no point to it. No more wood chips. All of the nutrient needed to pulse and cycle through the system exists in the plants that are here. And that's, that's a pretty magical moment. From here on out, it only gets more intense with that, but uh, there is management to be done. On this side, we're on the west side now, we're seeing colt's foot. They showed up on their own. They like this cool, moist context on the north side of the shrub layer. And we added in some thimbleberry. That's another very shade tolerant, spreading low layer. And we have fuki, which is very similar to colt's foot, but from Japan instead. And they're starting to fill out down in here. So the ground cover elements are starting to happen on this side a little bit. This side has uh, none of, there we go, and there we go, <laughs> has none of the miscanthus, and so there's little gaps here or there, but there's a lot more diversity happening, and I like that. Um, we've got the willows, the curly willow. Talked about this before. Some of them have up and died. Here's one that is just a skeleton, but it's acting as a great trellis for Shisandra vine, which is working its way through. And once the Shisandra finds its way up onto the hazelnut, onto the elderberry, that should all fill out pretty nicely. So even with some death in this system, you can see that gap, but it's pretty stimulating for the other members that are in here. So again, thank goodness for not going for one element. There are about five different varieties of elderberry that are in here. Elder seems like a great companion for the hedgerow here. It, they sucker and spread. They are shade enough tolerant that they can handle even when they're in competition for light. You know, here's this big willow happening. Um, Amorpha fruticosa or the river locusts over here. And it's just kind of growing and squeezing its way through figuring out where the light is. And by having so many different varieties, we have uh, flowering. You can see there's still flowers on this one. This elder here on the north side is still in flower and some of them are starting to ripen their fruit. So there'll be nectar flow for bees for quite a long time which overlaps with fresh fruit and medicine for the birds. Uh, so there's always value. If you're going to plant elderberry, think about at least two varieties. Maybe try to get cuttings or plants of four or five and let them sucker and spread and you'll have a huge overlap between flower and fruit that you can harvest and that the wild creatures can enjoy. That same side of the living wall I was just looking at, but now looking at it from the south to the north and you can see the high tunnel here. Question might be, well, would, does it make sense to have so much vegetation around this high tunnel? How does it get the light it needs? Well, the high tunnel is just to the south of this wall, so it's getting all of the light throughout the day, a little bit of shade in the late day, but since this is all deciduous cover, for the most part, once they drop their leaves in the fall, this high tunnel gets more than enough light from fall, winter, and into early spring to be able to grow some winter crops. So it's not as though if you have season extension, it has to be full bore straight in the sun in order to work. It's kind of like tucked into the jungle, but with an opening from above, that the sun can strike most of this. Not much room between the high tunnel and the wall, but again, being on the north side, I'm happy to have these hazelnuts reaching over. They're not blocking any light to crops on the inside, but they're also, I think, helping to keep this side of the high tunnel cool. So as it draws air from the outside, it's actually cooling down the tunnel during the season. It's like a little bit like a shade cloth, but a shade cloth that makes fat and protein. Look at the size of these, really nice hazelnut. Fingers crossed we'll be able to get at least some of the hazels from this this year. There are a ton all through here and a whole bunch in the chicken yard. It was a really nice year for hazel production.
overall, we're just so happy with this space, these plants and what they're doing for us and with us. Um, I'm going to wrap it up here because we're at nearly 15 minutes walking and looking at a wall of plants. But I guess the, the takeaway that I would want to reiterate, and hopefully it came through in a very clear way in the video, is that if you're thinking about installing some sort of visual barrier or wildlife corridor or hedgerow, windbreak, um, strong recommendation that I would love to offer up is really consider the idea of as much species diversity as possible, structural diversity as possible and lean into that density pattern as well. If you own pruners or handsaw, you can manage and adjust and change as it goes. And a lot of these plants can become nutrient to feed other plants. And lastly, it feels important to remind folks that sure, we had a rough idea of what this would look like as far as the plants and the layout when we started, at least a rough idea, but we've added and subtracted quite a bit over the years and it's an evolving, and changing systems. So uh, if you're thinking about doing it and you're not exactly sure where to begin or you feel like you've got to get it right before you start, at least our experience has been take that pressure off yourself and start planting. You can always adjust later on and at least the plants get a chance to start. So thanks for watching. Hope you have solid walls of lush plant life between you and less lovely spaces. Take care.